Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson. I'm a professor of construction management, and in this series, we're looking at how to read and understand prints for construction drawings. We've been looking at residential drawings in previous videos, and I've got a series of those videos, which are a little bit simpler house. Today, we're gonna to be looking at one that's a little bit more complex. This set of drawings has 19 pages in total, it's for production homes on a subdivision. So that's a little bit different than just doing a single custom home. As you'll see, this has two different front elevations for the home. So that what that means is that the front of the house is going to look different and the rest of the house will be much the same. In production building, they like to have repetition. It's almost like when you buy a car, you can buy uh, so many different models, but when you pick that one model, you only have a few limited choices of what you can do with it. So in production building, it's nice if we have only so many different choices of house, but they look different from the street. So in this particular example, we've got two front elevations that are different where the rest of the house is mostly the same. And so you can see from this, and I'll start with this, and we're going to do a few videos on these particular set of drawings. We call these the Brook drawings. They were drawn by Cassidy and Company, ar architectural technologists. Uh, and we're going to look at different elements. Today, I just want to give you an overview so that you get familiar with uh, the drawings. And then we'll dive into some of the unique qualities of the drawings as we go through things. Okay, so let's get started. Here's the first front elevation. I can zoom in so you can maybe see it a little bit better there. And so that's the first front elevation. You can see that it's got a few gable roofs. It's got an overall cottage or hip roof on the top. A little bit of a hip roof down here, hip roof over here. Uh, and we see this sort of bullseye window here. Uh, we've got sort of flat arches with soldier courses growing atop. Segmental arch with again voussoirs. That's the bricks that we find in a arch in a brick arch. It's a brick veneer house with a little bit of stone facing, uh, likely a manufactured stone, and so that gives it a distinct kind of look to it. It's got a little bit of these vinyl shakes that look like wood shingles or shakes uh, on the front. All right, so you now take a good look. You can see that. We'll scroll down a little bit, and we can see we've got. Uh, side elevation here, another side elevation, and you can sort of see uh, how the roof is and the gables are on here. And then we notice here, ah, there's another front elevation. So this is essentially going on top of or in front of uh, the same overall house. There's some differences which we'll go over, but essentially the rest of the house, the floor plan of the house is very similar. All right, and in this case here, we've got uh, we've got here a soldier course that's going across here, and it's got a roll-out course over top of it. We got a segmental arch here, uh, again with a keystone, but we got a flat roof over here. That's quite different. And we've got one gable with a hip and another hip roof over here. So it is looking quite different than the other house that we just looked at. Going back to the other house, just to refresh you, you can see that uh, quite different. Maybe you'll decide you have a, a preference of one over the other. Uh, I think maybe my preference is this one because there's a little bit more um, different things going on. Maybe some people would say there's too much and other people would say, no, I really like that. So there's, there's different choices for the elevations there, right? But essentially the house is more or less the same. So these are the elevations and of course you can see the side elevations because they've got to be different at the front because it is showing the flat roof, right? It's showing the flat roof intersection and the difference of the roof profiles over here. Uh, it is also got the rear elevation and it actually has uh, the rear elevation showing where you've got the roof here, you've got the patio doors and the various windows. Here, this looks like it's going to be a uh, window well, and we'll look at that later on in the floor plans. And it has a different choice for a rear elevation, and this says upgraded rear. Usually an upgraded rear in production housing means this, this rear they would use if it was like facing 
a river or a bike path maybe that goes behind the houses a lot of municipalities they want the neighborhood to look really nice so they force the builder to kind of dress it up a little bit on the rear of the house if it's kind of like not uh you know facing anything they just kind of go pretty plain with it because it'll be the backyard that's all you'll see but if it is we'll do it we'll jazz it up a little bit more with a little bit de more detailing with the brick and a lot more detailing on that gable end so that's not uncommon but this is what we call architectural control uh, that just means that the municipalities the towns the cities that these houses are being built in they want to have some control that the builder's not just going to do it the cheapest, fastest, easiest way. Because the cheapest, fastest, easiest way is the way they used to do it in the 1950s, where you'd have like 75 houses in a row and they're all the same. All right, you might have a few little tiny changes, but not hardly any. Uh, this is making sure that you walk down the street. It's like, oh, a lot of different uh, sort of elevations here. But you may only have five different uh, overall house designs and the faces of the house then each one of those five overall designs might have two different front elevations now you got ten different houses now you can also then mix the materials mix the colors and then you can also mirror image some of the houses so they're basically the opposite of what you see and so that gives all these different sort of contrasts and look to it and so you can end up with like 15 or 20 before you really have an exact repeat of the same house and that that helps to make the neighborhoods look much more distinctive so a lot of municipalities do that some don't and you can kind of see it because there's not that much variety like i mean builders are smart enough to know that they make them exactly cookie cutter it may down uh, the value that they can sell them for but generally you want to have some of these architectural controls in place to ensure some builders don't take maybe advantage of that all right and so these are, are done quite well as far as uh, the drawings go. And uh, I'm in Toronto, Canada. Canada, we do things with uh, metric very often. But a most of our low-rise residential is done in imperial measurement. So, you know, like the U.S. does everything imperial. Uh, we used to decades ago, but we converted to the metric system. We kind of have this conflict that goes between imperial and metric here, where we have our building code in metric, but our plywood and sheets are four foot by eight foot, that sort of thing. So I'm going to slide up, and I'll probably have to reorient uh, the drawings here. So I will reorient them, right? And this is basically the cover page and it's basically got table. It's got a bunch of different calculations. It's telling you about the elevations, right? And the different choices with the elevation. And it's giving it in square meters and square feet. As I said, we kind of have to end up doing things twice a lot. Uh, and this would be required by the municipality likely that they would want it in square meters. Uh, different information. So it's talking about area for the different elevations. So, you know, if we're looking at the total floor area uh, for the house, uh, elevation A is 2528 and 2569 for B. So I'll just zoom in on that a little bit so you can see it a little bit better. So you can see that it's 2528 and 2569. Uh, there'll be optional doors, which is at the side of the house, which you've got a, an option for. And it also depends on the lot, whether you can exit from the side, depending whether there's space on the, between the house and the property line. So those are different choices too. And coverage is a building code requirement too, as far as zoning goes. So how much is the building covering on the lot? And there's a whole bunch of different requirements uh, in regard to that. But you can see there's some slight differences, 1,542, 1,557. And that might be just where the roof sticks out or maybe there's a box window or something of that nature that changes the overall coverage. So you always look at the drawings too by the title block, um, the dates uh, that the information is drawn up on, the scale that is used and the scale uh, that means three sixteenths of an inch to the foot. And so that means every every inch that we see on the, um, sorry, every three sixteenths of an inch on the drawings represents one foot in real life. And so everything is, is compacted down when we scale. And uh, so 
As long as the drawings are plotted correctly, then it should be that you can actually take a scale ruler and you can actually measure things and it should still work out. That's another whole discussion for another day um, on that, uh, the scaling and scaling practices and that you shouldn't really be scaling drawings unless you're just doing estimates and if you can be off a little bit, it's okay. All right. So yes, and here is the construction notes. Now typically your drawings will have a set of construction notes and that is your references for detailed information regarding the whole drawings. Uh, Cassidy and Company does a very neat set of uh, construction notes. They pretty much standardize them by site uh, so that you get used to that cover page, the information and where to find it. The reference hexagons makes it very easy to locate information so you know you see a hexagon here and it says number five um, or number seven if i go to number seven here i'm going to find out information that that is pointing towards so in other words the basement concrete slab so that's my reference points following those hexagon symbols that saves you a lot of time so whenever i have a new set of drawings <clears throat> i always take a little bit of time and just take a high level view and that's all I'm doing right now is I'm just taking a high level view how is it organized how is the architect or designer uh, put in references what kind of tables do they have like they got door schedules I see numbers so that's telling me there's going to be numbers where the doorways are and then I can reference back to here to find out what size door is being used and if I know what size door is being used I can take that information and calculate what should the rough opening be if I'm framing that house uh, so that's valuable. Lintel and beam schedule in the U.S. they would call that header. Here we call it header two on construction sites, even though we probably shouldn't because in the building code, we refer to the lintel as the beam over a door or window, which is very often referred to as the header. In our building code, the header, the only place you're going to find a header is like in a floor, right? Where it's like a stairwell opening. Uh, so that's important to distinguish between them but here you go lintel and beam schedule and you see all these l's and there's different things there like this is talking about dimensional lumber two two by eights or two two by tens or three two by twelves this is talking about steel three and a half by three and a half by quarter inch thick angle irons that's why it's got that l shape it's an angle iron and that's these are all there because this is a brick veneer house to support the weight of the windows that goes over the sorry the brick that goes over top right so where you see l1 and l7 you have a wood lintel going over top to support the wood framing and you have here you have a steel lintel to support the brickwork over the top of the windows right so that's what all of those are referencing. So I'm just getting used how how is it being referenced? And how is the material listed? I've already checked, you know, the scale that's being used. And then I'll usually do what I was just doing with you. I would look at all of the elevations. I would look at all of the outside elevations, like I'm walking around the outside of the house. And I would try to get a good understanding of what I'm actually looking at. So I will rotate this. And so I'm looking at the front of the house here and in the legend with this type, you got to be really careful. What elevation am I looking at? I'm looking at elevation A because the floor plans are going to reference elevation A or elevation B, right? Those are the two elevation A and elevation B. So I'm looking at elevation A. And so I'm taking a look. I'm, I'm really taking a good look at the outside of the house, like I mentioned earlier. And then I'm walking around and this is going to be on the left side, right? So that's the left side elevation. And again, it tells you that on the legend. Uh, and so I'm walking down the side here. Okay. And I see they return the stone down the edge. I can see this must be for the gables. And then I'm looking at the right side elevation. Again, it will tell me right side elevation A. And I'm taking a good look at this and I go, oh, this is interesting. This mudroom door here. Uh, and we've got some siding material up here. And remember with elevation drawings, you can't really tell depth. So I'm not exactly sure is this sticking out or is that recessed in? So that I'm committing to memory. I wonder what's going on with that. And then here's the elevation B stuff. 
And I would again, probably I wouldn't look so much at elevation B right now. I would continue to look for elevation A stuff. So I'm just sliding down here and I'm looking at, oh, okay, rear elevation A and B. All right, so I'm looking at this and I'm getting a good sense of, because the rear on both of them is pretty much the same. Uh, it's telling you if the, you know, you're gonna see something different with the roof line uh, for the different elevations there, but elevation A would be this solid line. I'm gonna take a look over here at the plan view now too. That just gives me a good perspective. So the plan view, I can see that cottage or hip roof on the lower roof portion. I can see which direction the roofs are sloping. So this is gonna be a gable at the front here. Uh, I get a good good sense that uh, how the how the roofs are something. This is going to be another gable over here. This is coming down from this overall uh, hip roof that you see up here and here, and how that transcends along there. And again, you could transfer back and forth between the drawings to get a good sense of what is happening. Here's elevation B. So in this particular one. Uh, that is showing me that one gable over there. And so here I've got like more things going on. I've got a hip over here. I've got a valley coming down. I've got this sloping in here. I've got that sloping. And maybe I'm having, you know, sometimes when I'm looking at these things, this is elevation B over here. Sometimes I'm getting a little bit confused with what I'm looking at exactly over here. So that would be a good opportunity for me to better visualize it, to go back and say, oh, what exactly is going on here? I've got this gable coming across. I've got this uh, hip part coming across here. So that, that means back recessed in there is going to be a valley back in that point. Um, so I could probably pick up some of that if I take a look at the right side view. So this is the left side view. There it is. I can pick up some of that, what's happening over here, right? And so that's why this is going to slope down to here. This is acting like a valley in here. And that's where those roofs are joining up and coming out towards the front. So very much about reading construction drawings is getting used to what you're looking at and referencing and going back and forth with it. Now I'm gonna go back up now for a minute and I'm gonna turn it back around and we're gonna go down and we're gonna, we looked at the construction notes so we have a bit of understanding what's in there. We don't know everything yet, but we know how it's organized. We also know if we're confused about symbols, you always look for the legend and usually you, on the legend, you'll see if there's anything about the symbols that are being used or abbreviations that are being used on the drawing. That can be really a game changer and helpful for you. Uh, most of these are, are standardized, but again, you have designers that may have special symbols that they use because there's no symbol abbreviation police out there. Sometimes there's little nuanced differences. But if they're using it in their legend, you can be reasonably confident that that's how they're using it in the drawings, which saves you a lot of time and hassle. So if I look at this floor plan now, maybe I'll shrink it a little bit so you can see it out a little bit uh, at the big scale. Uh, and we've got here, this is elevation A. So when you got a set of drawings that's 19 pages and they got two elevation drawings, you better be always checking what is this drawing? Is this elevation A or this elevation B? So this is elevation A. And I can see around the outside edge here how the foundation is laid out, right? And I can see that I have a pilaster here, looks like, to strengthen the wall because it's such a long wall there. So they put this pilaster there um, to strengthen the wall. And I can see that we've got uh, window wells around the edges. This is saying it's unfinished, so you're not gonna have any finishes on the inside of this uh, particular uh, basement here. So I'm seeing that. I'm also seeing some information here that's quite interesting, which is I see uh, rebar here. And this area here, so I'll zoom in so you can see that. This area here, I see a cutting plane line, E. In fact, I see three. I see A, I see E, and I see B, okay? So E 
it means there's a cut through the wall here. And I'm not surprised to see rebar going around here because this section of wall here is laterally unsupported. That means like there's a stairwell here and the floor, which acts as basically, it adds rigidity to the foundation walls. It supports the walls against the lateral pressure from the backfill in the garage or the backfill against the outside of the foundation walls. So it's strengthened everywhere where the floor is, but where you have a stairwell open opening, it's weak. Or if you have a big window opening, these are small window openings, so they're okay. But if you have a big window opening, then you should be expecting there's probably going to be some steel that's put in the wall to strengthen that wall at that point because it's laterally unsupported there. So it says there's a cutting plane line. So I'm just observing, okay, there is E, right? So there is section E and that is showing where the rebar is going. That is telling me the size of rebar, 320 M bar, that's 20 millimeter bar. Uh, so that's the diameter of the bar. Um, when we're looking at that, that's probably about three quarter inch rebar uh, at four foot, uh, sorry, four inches on center, four inches on center. And uh, that just means those are at four inches on center. You're going to put three of them. You're going to place it near the top of the wall and you're going to place it towards the inside because the inside of the wall is going to be under tension. Pressure against the wall puts the inside of the wall under tension. Concrete is not very strong when it's under tension. Uh, so we need to add steel, which is extremely strong. And those combinations gives us a reinforced concrete wall, which is extremely strong. So that's what you'll find in a lot of low rise residential, the overall foundation walls and the footings, they may not need rebar. They may, depending on the geotechnical uh, engineering requirements for the lot, uh, they may require it and it depends on the depth, but oftentimes they may not. And again, your jurisdiction may be different than uh, where we are, but uh, you definitely look for it wherever you see openings. So that's something that I always um, check for. You can also see how's this designer put in things like there's dash lines here and that's representing a three piece rough in bath, right? So this is just showing, okay, that's a rough in. And when it's dashed, it means it's optional. That means that, you know, if you want to pay extra, they will rough that in for you. But if you don't, it doesn't get roughed in. Uh, so that's, that's one of the ways that that is being indicated on the drawings. We can see here cutting line B, there is essentially a grade beam in this and it's got four 10 M uh, rebars, right? 10 M would be about three eighths of an inch rebar. Uh, so essentially they would be placed here. And again, this is to stabilize the garage slab, which tends to want to uh, crack and settle very often uh, because maybe the, generally this has been filled in very often. So it's disturbed soil. Hopefully it's been compacted properly because otherwise you get lots of problems still. And that's what the grade beam is for. Okay, so I can slide down here. You've got an option, then in this case, optional finished lower level plan, right? Elevation A. So it gives you an option to finish it. And then in that case, this would be completely finished and have a bathroom over here. This part here is unfinished still, but this part would be finished. So I'm just, right now, I'm just high level getting a sense of what's going on. All right, here's my first floor. So I've come up the stairs. Uh, and, you know, in the basement, I'm looking, I'm observing this and it says low headroom. That tells me that the ceiling here, that little X there is the designer sort of saying this and this and this is not all at the same level of ceiling that the rest of the basement is at. So it's like a little flag. So I observe that and I think, okay, of course, that's going to be the garage. Of course, that's going to be the front porch. Uh, but this, okay, what's going on here? Low headroom. So what you have here then, when you go up here, you've got a sunken mudroom. And very often that happens because if you're going to put a door to the garage, right, it, you don't want to have too many steps in the garage. You, you know, down because that's going to take up space and you might not be able to effectively park your car. So if you sink this down one or two steps, in this case, one, one riser, that gets you closer to the garage floor, right? That makes that transition much easier to do. So I'm not surprised about that kind of stuff, right? 
And so I then take a look around and I'm also noticing, oh wow, there's these cutting plane lines AA. So that's telling me, and I'll go back here. Um, well, I didn't put it there. Usually it goes right through and they'll put it through. Maybe, is it here? There it is. All right, there it is. Because the cutting plane they didn't put for the finished basement. All right, so I'm learning that as I go through it. There's section AA. And here is that section AA through the first floor. And I'm still in elevation A. I'm checking that I've got the right one. And I'm looking this over. All right, so now I'm going to kind of pretend I'm walking through the front door. And I'm looking around. Okay, so the living room is to my left. I've got some sort of column here. Oh, it says 42 inch high half wall. So that means that I can't walk straight through there. There's a little bit of a wall that's 42 inches up off the floor. Right, probably so I could put a sofa or something against this wall, maybe. Uh, that's why that, that's raised up a little bit there. Here's where the entrance area is. And then it says FA. I don't know what FA is, so I'm gonna look at the construction notes. And if I went back to the construction notes and I looked at FA, I would quickly see that FA is flat arch, right? So if I go down here, FA flat arch. And to me, that means that it's just going to be like a doorway. It's going to drop down and it's got like a flat, straight arch going across uh, the top of it. Okay, so again, like I said, you can reference the abbreviations. I'm just getting comfortable, familiar with uh, uh, the drawings and uh, walking my way through it uh, here. And let me get to the right page. So we're there. There we are. There's a PR. Well, what does PR mean? It means powder room. Uh, you don't have a bathtub or a shower. You just have uh, a sink, a basin, is the proper name for in a bathroom, and you've got a toilet. Again, symbols, that little symbol there is an exhaust fan. Again, on the construction notes, I would see that's that little kind of swirl with the circle. That's an exhaust fan. And I'm walking through, I see dining room. Oh, I'm noticing optional coffered ceiling. So that's like a bulkhead that goes around for decorative purposes around the outside of the dining room. Can give it some real look to it, especially if you add some pot lights. Uh, to the right here is the stairs. It's got a bull nose on the bottom. Uh, I can see over here that we got a walkway through over here. Uh, we've also got a um, walkway through over here. We've got a support column for a beam, looks like, going across here and sort of here. Uh, and we also have uh, the breakfast area and the kitchen. It's got a big island in it. Well, maybe not huge, but 36, three foot six by three foot six, which would be 42 inches by 42 inches. So we've got that. We can walk around the kitchen, get an idea of the great room. There's a fireplace visualizing it visualizing it there's a step down to that sunken mud room and this is how i get to the basement so you're always sort of walking around checking things out oh there's a little desk here a little work area here always walking around checking it out so i go upstairs and in the upstairs come up the the stairs here and i see oh okay this is showing i go down so i would be coming up here there's a little technology center probably like a work area for the kids, you know, for school stuff, or it could be a little mini office area. Uh, so that's that technology center, could be used for a lot of different things. And you notice there's a separation between the master bedroom and the other bedrooms. And they're even not at the same elevation height from the first floor as uh, the technology center. So we're gonna go up four risers here and four risers are down from there. It's the same thing for up uh, from here to the master bedroom, big master ensuite uh, with a big tub, double sinks, nice big shower and a uh, toilet. And then of course, if I turn left, oh look, closet, closet, walk-in closet. So lots of closet areas here, right? Uh, I'm observing, oh, okay, this is where the access hatch to the attic will be. If I looked at number 23, it would tell me that. Uh, optional direct vent fireplace so you could put a direct vent gas fireplace in there nice big ba master um, bedroom coming over here i can i can come back down go back up uh, i can see that there's oh there's a little uh, bookshelf niche there 
right? And there's a detail for it, so I could look for that later. Uh, there's a washer and dryer. So this must be for those stacked washer and dryer units that you would stack on top of each other because it's a fairly small closet, so that's what would fit in there. And we've got bedroom four, bedroom three, bedroom two. And we've also got the shared uh, bathroom for the, I guess, the kids' bedrooms uh, here. And it's got a bathtub, probably with a shower, vanity, and toilet um, there, or water closet, as they like to call it. So that gives us, a, I'm getting a good sense of the layout and the space. And I'm looking at these sizes. You know, I'm looking at these sizes. It gives me a quick reference here. Uh, you know, it's 10 foot by 14 foot 10. Uh, there, so I'm getting a good reference for the size of the rooms and spatially, you know, you ha you start to want to try to get used to that if you're new to construction. Like, what is 13 foot? Imagining it, and sometimes it's not bad to just take a tape measure and measure out some of your own rooms, just so you start to visualize what is 14 feet, what is 17 feet. And it gives you a really good sort of heads up on things. And so, with a new set of drawings, this is what I always do. I'm just looking around. I'm trying to visualize what's going on, right? I'm really trying to get a good handle on the drawings. And then in future videos, I'm going to talk about uh, really sort of zoning in on specific drawings and looking for information specific to what you need right now to build, right? So if I'm doing the foundation work, I'm looking at the site plan. I'm really trying to figure out, you know, how deep we have to excavate, locates, uh, setbacks, uh, all of that information. I'm, I'm looking really closely at. If we've already got the foundation in, I'm really starting to think about the details for the framing and all the components that have to go in. I'm also thinking way ahead. I'm thinking about doorways and I'm making sure that there's enough returns on the doorways that there's going to be space to put the casing that you want to put. Some clients, they have a very narrow casing. Some clients pick a wide casing. Well, if you don't leave enough space, then it becomes a problem. It doesn't look that nice uh, when you actually finish it. So you have to be always thinking ahead too. That's the advantage of visualizing things. It helps you to see things as you visualize and as you look ahead. It makes things a lot clearer from that perspective. So it's always good to walk through it and every time you look at it, you're gonna see new things. You might be really impressed with somebody, uh, you know, that, that's uh, gone through the drawings, a site super and they, they they know the drawings inside and out and they're flipping back and forth. You know what though? They spent a lot of time going through those drawings. Nobody gets a new set of drawings and is like, well, yeah, I know that I know that I know that easy piece of cake. Uh, if they do, that's a little bit uh, too quick. You've got to be pretty meticulous with this and you got to really come to grips with where the challenges are going to be. And then you got to start planning and making sure that certain things are discussed and covered. And there's going to be mistakes on the drawings. Nobody's perfect. You want to uh, document things that you can't find certain bits of information. And then you want to basically um, RFI, request for information, get a response on exactly what you're asking about. So that it's documented, it's clear, and then you can move forward from there. Um, so yeah, that's our introduction to the Brook drawings here. And I hope you enjoyed that uh, and we'll be doing many follow-ups. So if you enjoyed this, please click subscribe, click the notifications. Uh, you can click the playlist. I have many playlists on my channel from project management, planning and scheduling, project management tips, uh, site management, cost control, um, and uh, Microsoft project, as well as understanding construction drawings. So I'm Tom Stevenson, wishing you a wonderful day, and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.